Welcome back to part three of the Terrain tutorial series. This is part of the Magic Market series in which we were responsible for creating the environment assets. So this is a very conceptual series so far. We are going over the ideas of workflow and hopefully you can pick up some tips and tricks to use in your own workflow. Now for this part, we're going to be using materials that we generated using our COP network. Now for you, you could use your own textures and follow along with this very easily. If you have access to Quixel assets, so the textures that they have up there, perhaps grab a ground texture and a cliff texture and you can follow along with this. Otherwise, if you need free textures, you can go to textures.com, I believe. You'll have to sign up, but you'll be able to get some ground textures and cliff textures if you'd like. And then you can very easily follow along with what we're going to be doing. So let's get into it. Now, the next step in this would be to go over and create a LOP network. We can just call this terrain gen in here. And this LOP net can just be terrain stage, just like that. Okay, so we go inside of our LOP net and we're going to do a SOP import. We're going to SOP import in our terrain. So just find the SOP path for terrain out. And now you can see our terrain is in here. So once we have it, we'll load it as reference and give it a primitive path. So this can be forward slash terrain and the input path prefix can also be forward slash terrain. If we go ahead and switch to our Solaris viewport, you can see that we now have terrain over here and it has height and mesh. Now, why does it have height and mesh? That's because of our extrude that we did. So it's actually separating these, which isn't a big deal. It's completely fine. From here, we can go down to geometry handling. And over here, we are just going to enable treat polygons as subdivision surfaces. This is extremely useful. When we add our displacement maps, it will do some render time subdivision on this geometry. Now, this is resource intensive. So do keep that in mind. The higher resolution that your geometry is, the more difficult it will be for this to subdivide it. But the added benefit of subdivisions is that your displacement can show through a lot better. And this is also distance based. So if your camera is closer to a particular area, there will be more subdivision in that area. We can just call the SOP import terrain import. So the other thing that we need to do for SOP imports is give them a layer save path. Now USD saves layers. And the way I like to think of it is almost as a checkpoint. So it will save that current layer to a particular place and it can call upon that layer from that place. So this SOP import can be saved to a layer save path. And over here, I like to just make a folder and call it layers. We can create a terrain layer dot USD. Simple as that. And now what we're going to do is something that we did in the rock tutorial series. It's referencing a material onto our terrain. So to do that, we drop down a reference node and the primitive path will be terrain forward slash materials. Now that doesn't exist yet, but it will soon. We're also going to say reference from multi input because we're going to be adding a material library as the second input. So a material library in here and inside of this material library, we can make a basic material. We'll do a principled shader. So over here, we can drop two texture nodes. So this is a texture right over here. So I've just got this basic ground diffuse. So usually you would do a ground diffuse texture and you would also do a separate one down here. And what I like to do is color correct the one, making it slightly darker. So decreasing gamma very slightly and value very slightly. Then you do a mix. So that's a color mix, plugging color into the first input and this corrected color into second input. And what you can do with that is run a unified noise static, grab your global variables, plug position into the position of this unified noise static take that noise and use it as the bias. Then over here, you can just change the frequency of this noise. So we can decrease it and maybe make it a Worley with a standard FBM fractal type. That can go into your base color. The cool thing about doing it like this is that you can avoid the very obvious tiling because you're adding a noise to the actual texture. Now, the other thing that you can do is bring in your UV attribute. So if you drop a bind node, and just put in UV, set it to a three float and override with type. You put that into each one of these and then you do a UV transform. What you can do on this second diffuse down here is actually change the scale and rotation of your UVs. 
So we can maybe rotate over here and maybe scale it down slightly. Now, what that does is it also removes any sort of tiling that you may have. Okay, so that would be your diffuse, the base diffuse, right? And so if we wanted to take a look at what this looks like, we would have to apply it to our terrain. To do that, we go over here and we drop down and assign material. Now to assign a material, you need to choose a primitive. So let's choose the primitive that we want to apply it to, which is our terrain. So click and drag over your terrain into primitives. And the material path is this material over here, principal shader one, just into material path. And let's change that principal shader's name just to terrain texture. And so now we just change this over here to terrain texture. Cool. And what we can do is just set up a camera over here and an environment light and just give this an HDRI and perhaps just an area light over here. Cool. So something like that. And let's go to our camera. And so we can actually render this and fair warning, it's not going to look amazing, but you know, we still have work to do. So let's take a look. So um, as you can see, there's an issue with our UVs. This is actually a scaling issue. So all we have to do is drop another UV transform and let's just plug it in to our ground fuse. We can stop our karma render over here. And what we're going to do is just scale down our UVs. So a scale of 0.1 might be okay, maybe a bit lower. We'll do 0.06 for the top one. And down here, we'll do something like 0 0.08. Okay, so something like that. And we can take a look now and see if that makes a difference. Okay, so that seems to be working. Let's take a look from a different angle. Now, it's a bit difficult to tell how our noise is actually distributing this. So let's make this a much bigger difference so that we can actually tell what's happening here. So we will vastly change this, a UV shift and a push in value and gamma. And we can now see what that looks like so that we can get an idea of what our noise is doing for us. Okay, so as you can see, it's quite a high frequency noise that we're using. So let's drop the frequency on this noise just to make this fit a bit better. So we'll do back to GL and drop this noise to 0 0.05 or around there. Okay, so let's see how that looks. Yeah, so you can see that breaks up our pattern and it adds some variation to a texture that's actually just the same everywhere. So what we can do with that is put this back to the way it was, just control middle mouse on U shift and value and gamma, and then we'll just drop the value and gamma over here. So now you can see that same pattern, but now there are darker areas in our terrain. So this is looking fairly decent. This is a good start. We have a good base texture. However, we need to now set up our cliffs. So to do that, we're going to have to bring in the rock face attribute that we created. And we drop a bind node. And on this bind node, we call in that rock underscore face. And I think that's what it was called. We can just check over here, middle mouse, uh, rock face. Yeah, so it's called rock face. So we'll just bring that in and use that for a color mix. This time, however, we're going to be mixing something different. So we'll use it for now. But what we need to bring in is a texture. So we're going to use a texture over here. And the texture we need to bring in is our cliff face texture. Okay, so we plug this into secondary and we're also going to need UVs for this. So let's bind our UVs in over here. And we're probably going to need a UV transform. So we're just going to preemptively drop the scale on this to about 0.1. Okay, so let's take a look at this now. Now that we're mixing them based on this cliff attribute or rather the rock face attribute. So there you can start to see the kind of look we're going for. Our rock face is probably too big, so we can decrease the scale again. We'll drop it over here to 0.1. 0 0.4. Let's take a look at that. Great, so that looks a lot better. We're now getting some decent shape over here. We're also going to do what we've done before, where we change the texture with a UV transform, just like this, and make one that's slightly bigger. So we'll actually make one about 0.08, and we'll make the other one about 0.06. So just a bit of variation, maybe something like this. Yeah, okay, so something like that. Once again, color mixing them, mix this together with this. And the bias that we're going to do is going to be a unified noise static. So we'll duplicate this one over here, increase the frequency slightly, 
and then take this and plug it into this color mix bias and then that can go into secondary for this color mix. Cool, so that should give us an interesting look. Let's take a look at what that looks like. Yeah, much better. So there's variation in the size of our textures and that looks pretty good. So something that we'll definitely want is now a displacement. So the displacement is going to be a bit trickier because of the way that we've done this. The main thing that we're going to need to focus on is using the correct noises and the correct UV transforms when we work with our displacement. So this UV transform over here, we can call this UV cliff one, and this one down here can be UV cliff two. And then up here, we can make UV ground one, and this one over here will be UV ground two. Then we just need to know which noise separates what. So this over here, is ground noise. This one down here is cliff noise. And now it's really simple. If we bring in our displacement, so we just drop new texture nodes, we'll drop one over here. This one will be our cliff displacement. And we know that we should put cliff one into here. We can duplicate the cliff displacement and we'll put cliff UV two into here. So now these two displacements are matching these two textures. All that's required is also a color mix so that they are mixed the same way as well. So we mix these over here and we bring in the cliff noise as the bias. So naming the important things in your material library is extremely useful, right? As you can see, we now know what needs to be mixed with what and where our UVs need to go. So we can also do this for our ground texture and let's go ahead and grab our ground texture. And that would be the ground displacement. Once again, duplicating it using our UV ground one in the first one and our UV ground two in the second one, and then a color mix where we mix one and two based on the ground noise. So ground noise right over here, plug it in. Great, so now we have these two displacements right over here and they should be mixed by the cliff. So let's do a mix color once again. So our ground should be mixed with our cliff based on the rock face attribute. And this can actually go into a multiply right over here and we're going to promote the second input. So just put that as a constant, just like that. And that can go into displacement. The reason that we give this a constant is so that we can control how much displacement we want. So we can start with 0.01 and see how that looks, but this won't work unless we go over to our displacement and just say enable input displacement, right? So now it knows to displace. We can then try a comma render and see how this looks. And, uh, our displacement is kind of low, so we can increase this and see what value looks good. And now you will notice that it does take quite long for this to calculate your displacement, and it's largely because of this treat polygons as subdivision surfaces. If this was not on, or if the original geometry was lower resolution, this would go a lot faster because it doesn't have to do as many calculations for subdivisions before actually calculating your displacement. Okay, so after some experimentation, I found that when you multiply this over here, the ground gets blown out of proportion and the rocks look pretty much right with a value of one. So what you might want to do is not multiply over here, but multiply each one of these individually. So you can just multiply this over here and multiply this over here and do a constant for each. So for the ground, we'll do a displacement of 0.2. And for the cliff faces, we'll do a displacement of 0.6. And that should give us much better results. So once again, I will just try this render again. And there we go. We've got the basis of a decent terrain. Now, of course, there would be a lot of other things that I would change. And there are a lot of things that I did change. So for the magic market, I also had a grass. So I textured this differently depending on a grass attribute, which helped a lot. And I also darkened the cliffs. So those two things do help a fair amount, but in general, this is looking decent, right? You have everything in place for a terrain that looks pretty good. As you can see, your cliffs over here all have this texture and it's all procedural. You can't really notice any of the tiling and it doesn't look too bad. So yeah, in the next part, we're going to be taking this terrain and I'm going to be showing you how to actually instance things into this terrain. So if you want to add plants and grass and rocks, 
and all of those things, how would you go about doing that? Um, and that will be the last part for the terrain series, as well as the last part for the magic market series. So I know that this terrain series is a lot more abstract, but the idea is to show you workflows rather than having this as a step-by-step -step tutorial that's easy to follow along. So just try to take away workflow ideas from this rather than an actual finished product. So I will see you in the next part. Thank you for watching once again. Bye.